Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but um, uh, the organizers are telling me we have a few, we have time for a couple of questions before we break for lunch. Um, so questions, comments, um, and if you would, if you move to the mics again at the, in the aisles. There's no mic. <laughs> I can try. I'll talk up. Can you hear me? Okay. We have one down here. <laughs> I'll yield my mic. I, I stole the mic there. Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Kathy Buckley. Um, I was an undergrad here and I got my master's as well. And um, I was here during the Vietnam War years, and there have been lots of you know big issues that have come up, uh, including apartheid in South Africa and now divestment. And it seems that um, you know, MIT is a huge technological engineering science uh, giant, but um, tends to lag morally. It, it doesn't really you know, get out in front. You know, Stanford has decided to divest coal and um, tar sands, and MIT has decided not to do any of that. So I'm wondering if, um, if, if, if an institute like this that does lead that way you know, in these other fields and obviously has huge connections to industry sometimes that do great harm. Is it possible for an institution like that to also be a moral leader? And if you think that's a positive thing, how would the political science department here help engender that? Thank you. Well, I, th I think, I don't remember, is it on? I don't know the name of the project, but the, the people in this department were the ones who explained to the engineering department why nuclear power wasn't going to sell in America and why they had to give up on the idea that that was going to be the answer to the global warming problem. And there's been a lot done here and it's helping the scientists understand how to explain Peep to people their work on warming and climate change. And I don't know about the coal divestment or this specific divestment, but MIT has always been very good on understanding how to explain things. I keep thinking, believe it or not, of a line from Jack Kemp, people don't know what you care, no, people don't care what you know until they know you care. And MIT has been very good at studying how to explain to people why you care about this and why they should care about it. And I think that's part of the issue. And during the Vietnam War, when I was jailed as the only American professor who wouldn't testify in front of a grand jury about the sources of his research, the president of MIT and the faculty at MIT both contributed to my defense fund and provided um, affidavits for the court as to why it was important that a judge be involved in making a, a scholar expose the sources of his research. And Daniel Ellsberg was a visiting fellow here at the time when all the Pentagon Papers were released. It's not the same as being Noam Chomsky, but it was a, fo a form of important activism. And I can say I've never had a stranger experience in my life than going from being a fascist to Noam Chomsky's favorite source by being subpoenaed by Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just add uh, a, a little bit on this. Um, I think uh, having spent a lot of time at MIT, 30 years of my life here, uh, and now uh, at a different institution, um, I, I think that none of, you know, these institutions are very complex. They try to do uh, the right thing. They don't always do the right thing. I think that what's so truly distinctive about MIT um, is that it blends together the kind of flatness, lack of hierarchy, uh, true meritocracy, uh, which is actually quite rare. Uh, in the academy, this is true. You know, there are no honorary degrees here. You have to be able to get in and, and stuff like that. It's no legacies, uh, so it's a very, very. Uh, so you have the meritocracy, and you have uh, a true commitment to excellence. Uh, and everyone, I think, who's here is really working the hardest they can to actually sort of push the uh, the envelope and promote excellence. Again, a value that I think we take for granted here, but again. I don't think is always uh, uh, commonly shared uh, elsewhere. And I think that there are many, many cases where MIT has stepped up around other aspects of environmental change, other issues about um, 
peace and prosperity, uh, other ways of uh, thinking about democratic uh, engagement, and other times, uh, like all imperfect organizations, maybe have fallen short. Uh, but I would say that this is an institute that does try to lead, not just intellectually, but also through its values. Um, this has been, a, f for me, a, especially this has been a fascinating um, discussion, and I think for all of the current uh, faculty and students here, it's given us a, a good sense of, of the charge we have going forward on the, on, the, on the values and the traditions and norms that we should continue to, to nurture. Um, so please join me in thanking our panelists again for a wonderful session. Well, thanks all for a very stimulating morning. Um, let me tell you a little bit about lunch logistics. As part of our 50th anniversary celebration, we invite you to the department for lunch. And for those of you who haven't seen the department in a while, we've had a significant cosmetic upgrade, thanks to Rick Locke during his headship. So as you know, the department's located on the fourth floor of E53 across the street here. And uh, there will be staff people on the way to point the direction. And there you will find lunch and drinks. And there's seating throughout the department, uh, in the hallways, in the suites, in the classrooms. So feel free to explore. Feel free to take a look at the departmental timeline in the hallway near the elevators. Enjoy the conversation and the lunch. And we will reconvene here at 2 PM. Thanks.